Hi all, it's Pastor Matt Kennedy here, really looking forward to spending some quality time with you guys into the Word of God. D.A. Carson and Max Licato once said, If God had perceived that our greatest need had been information, God would have sent us an educator. If our greatest need had been technology, God would have sent us a scientist. If our greatest need had been money, God would have sent us an economist. If our greatest need had been pleasure, God would have sent us an entertainer. If God had perceived that our greatest need was political stability, he would have sent us a politician. If he had perceived that our greatest need was health, he would have sent us a doctor. But God, seeing our sin and our alienation from him, our profound rebellion, our death, knew that our greatest need was forgiveness. So God sent us a saviour. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I just ask that you would give me the words to speak in each of us, Lord, myself included, the ears to hear. I just ask that your Holy Spirit would touch the hearts and minds of each and every person. Encourage people where they need encouragement and challenge people where they need challenging. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' beautiful name. Amen. So today, given we're only five days out from Christmas, we're going to have a break from our Timothy series as we look at a part of the Christmas story as found in Matthew 1, 18 to 23. I'm always intrigued by the Christmas story and the all-encompassing hope that it holds. Make sure you have your Bibles out and ready to go as we delve into God's Word and look at the very start of this amazing story. Okay, so starting at Matthew 1.18. Now, for those who are hoping that I would include the genealogy of Jesus, the first 17 verses of this chapter, I'm just going to apologize now. As for today, we're not actually going to go there. We're going to be starting from verse 18. So Matthew 1, 18. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Okay, so we have, for the very least, a very interesting start, don't we? Here we have a young lady betrothed to Joseph. Now, before we go moving on anywhere further, let's deal with what it is meant for, for somebody to be betrothed. Um, some think it's like an engagement. Others think it's an actual marriage. So let me explain how this actually works. Back in the time frame of Jesus, the process of marriage wasn't quite as simple as you might think. It is vaguely similar, vaguely, to what we might do now, in as much as there are two steps involved. Uh, for us, the first is that we can get engaged. We get engaged to be married, which could uh, well last anywhere from one month to years. Uh, and the second is that the marriage itself, where the bride and groom come together and formally and legally tie the knot. Uh, that's what we do today. Back in Jesus' day, they also had two steps uh, to the Jewish marriage process. The first step was the betrothal. Now, betrothal really has no, it has no real commonality, you might say, to what we know as engagement, other than it happens before the marriage itself. <clears throat> when Mary became betrothed to Joseph, it was like a verbal contract between the man and the woman uh, completed in front of witnesses. I remember when I was in the bank on uh, one of the pranks that we would play on some poor unsuspecting new employee was to send them to another bank to pick up a verbal contract. I remember sending a young employee to the ANZ bank across the road to pick up a verbal contract from their manager for me. Now, the manager picked up on it straight away and sent them to the National Australia Bank, who then sent them to the Commonwealth Bank, who then sent them to St. George. Um, a lady at St. George worked through the request word by word with the new staff member until they worked it out for themselves that it was not possible to pick up a verbal contract. Uh, it took a while, but they eventually did forgive me and we became really good mates. But while we jest about the validity of a verbal contract, uh, back in Jesus' time period, the Jews actually had a verbal contract system in place, uh, verifiable by witnesses. The betrothal had a legal standing, you might say. It bound the two people involved to the uh, betrothal. It, in fact, it was so binding, the only way to break it, uh, to break it or to get out of it was for one of the parties to die 
or for an official divorce to happen. Uh, which is why we see in Matthew 1.19 that Joseph decided to divorce her, even though they weren't officially married yet. Uh, verse 19, And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. You see, up until this point, the process of the betrothal was that for a period of seven, several months, possibly and probably longer, the lady, Mary in this case, was to stay with her family. Uh, when the set time frame of the betrothal was completed, the, wo the woman would finally leave her family's house and move into her husband's home, where they will become officially husband and wife, living under the same roof. Um, it's also worth noting that the language is still used here, where Joseph is called Mary's husband, even though they're still in that betrothal period and haven't yet gone through the Jewish rites of marriage. That's how binding between a man and a woman betrothal is. And that's how betrothal worked back in Jesus' day. So when we read here in Matthew how Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, that's what it means. It was the time frame where they were legally bound to one another, but hadn't moved in with one another as husband and wife yet. So Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together. She was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Now, to be found with child outside of marriage and or in the betrothal period was a big, big issue. Sexual relations, even between a betrothed couple, was strictly forbidden. It was seen as an act of adultery. And as we know, adultery, especially back in Jesus' day, came with the harshest of penalties, death by stoning. If a woman was found to be with child outside of marriage, then there is a big problem. Joseph, in this situation, could have turned Mary over to the authorities, exposing her pregnancy and bringing much shame to her and to her family. The problem with this option was that Mary would not only have to publicly bear the shame, but there was a distinct possibility that she might be hurt if not killed, according to the laws regarding those caught in adultery. The second option was to just divorce her quietly, not to make a fuss walk and walk away from the situation. Given that Joseph was a man, a just man, uh, and also the fact that he would have loved Mary, um, as we see in verse 19, Joseph chose to d quietly divorce Mary uh, so as to not subject her or her family to such a disgrace. This would have been a tough situation, tough situation for both Mary and Joseph to find themselves in. Joseph loved Mary. He would have found her trustworthy up until this point, but based on worldly wisdom, the love of his life has seemingly betrayed him, given that she is pregnant, to someone other than himself. And to put another level of strangeness to the situation, she's adamant that she hasn't been unfaithful, but she is pregnant by the will and act of God. How would you go? if you were Joseph in this situation. I'm sure that even Mary didn't quite comprehend what was happening. She just trusted God. She, she trusted that he had all things in hand, including Joseph. And he did. Matthew one twenty. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, Son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. You can imagine Joseph waking up from that dream, can't you, saying, Say what? So you're telling me that her story is actually true? It really did happen? The angel of the Lord has come to turn things around for both Mary and for Joseph, encouraging Joseph not to persist in his plan to quietly divorce Mary, but to continue to take her as his wife. Joseph also was told just how special this baby that Mary carried actually was when the angel of the Lord tells him that the baby conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Now, wouldn't that just rock your world? But what we see is a faithful man. As Joseph trusts and obeys the commands of the Lord, he put the honour of God over his own honour. Same thing Mary's done. How about you? Are you willing to trust in God and do the things that you have been called to do? In Yorkshire, England, during the 1800s, the early 1800s, two sons were born to a family named Taylor. 
The older, older one set out to make a name for himself by entering Parliament and gaining public prestige. But the younger son chose to give his life to Christ. He later recalled, Well do I remember, as in unreserved consecration, I put myself, my life, my friends, my all, upon the altar. I felt I was in the presence of God entering into covenant with the Almighty. With that commitment, Hudson Taylor turned his face towards China and obscurity. As a result, he is known and honoured on every continent as a faithful missionary and the founder of China Inland Mission. For the other son, however, there's, there's no lasting monument. When you look in the encyclopedia to see what the other son has done, apparently you find these words. The brother of Hudson Taylor. He that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Whose will do you do? Whose will do you do? When God calls for you to be generous with your free will offering or to be generous with somebody that you see in need, do you do this? Or are money and possessions more important to you than trusting in God's provision? When you're called to share the good news with that friend or colleague or schoolmate, do you do it? Or is your friendship or reputation not worth rocking the boat over by bringing God into it? When God tells you not to get involved with that guy or girl because they're not a follower of Jesus, or not to flirt with that person at work that you just know that you shouldn't. Do you listen? Or do you think that you know better than God who created you and you see it as just a bit of fun and nothing serious and that God should just chill? Let me encourage you, friends. Be like Joseph. He was an amazing, honourable man, a just man, a man who loved his wife, a man who trusted and obeyed his God, no matter how bizarre the situation seemed, no matter how it might affect his reputation, no matter what it might cost him. Friends, be like Joseph. Be willing to trust God and do his will, because what the angel tells Joseph next is going to have an effect on the entire universe. Every atom and molecule in the entire universe was about to have the one through whom they were created step from his spiritual kingdom into his creation. The very one through whom all things were created, nothing exists that didn't come through Jesus, was about to enter the world. In fact, according to the angel, he was already here. The baby had already been conceived and was growing inside the most favoured of women, Mary. This baby, as we'll see soon, was the one who would bring hope to a world devoid of it. Years ago, a S-4 submarine was rammed by another ship and quickly it sank to the bottom of the ocean. The entire crew was trapped within that vessel. Various ships were in the ocean at that time and they rushed to the scene of the disaster, but no one really knew what that crew went through on those few hours underneath the water. Men bravely clung to all the oxygen that they could get until slowly it gave out. One diver who came to the rescue placed his ear on the side of the vessel and listened and there were various tapping noises that were heard. Somebody was tapping Morse code. The question that was being brought to that man who had his ear to the side of that vessel was this. What do you think it was? What do you think they were asking? This is what they were asking. Is there any hope? Is there any hope? <clears throat> we too are like those sailors who found themselves in a dire situation. And we ask the same question. Is there any hope? And God answers this age-old question when the angel tells Joseph about the baby that is to come. Matthew 1.21 She will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. 
This is big stuff. And I'm certain that Joseph had no real idea as to what was being revealed to him at that moment by God. God was telling Joseph his plan for reconciliation with humanity. God's plan for salvation. This was the pinnacle of the plan that had been waited for for so long. God had first hinted at it way back in Genesis 3.15 when God said, He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. God had a plan. And Jesus was always, and he's always been, the central figure in that plan. He came to save his people from their sin. That's you and I, guys. Sin is a huge problem. It's something that we are all guilty of. So many people think that being good is good enough. That God would have to accept them because they are generally good people. If this is you, if you think that you got a ticket to heaven because you think you're good enough, you've done enough, you've earned your way kind of thing here, then you're going to be bitterly disappointed, even worse. Jesus tells us in Mark 10, 18, and Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Jesus knows exactly who he is. But did the guy who called Jesus good, did he know? Jesus knew, but did he know? Did he really have any idea? And Jesus challenges him and us with this question. But the point I'm wanting for us to see here today with this passage is that Jesus pointed out that no one is good except God alone. You and I think that we're good, but we don't have even a run on the board compared to God. And we don't come within a bull's roar of God's, even God's minimum standard. We see in Isaiah 64, 6, when we're given a glimpse of what our righteousness, what our good looks like to God, when Isaiah tells us that all have become like one who is unclean and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf and like the wind our sins sweep us away. Our very best efforts towards righteousness, the very best things that you have done, that your greatest efforts to be good, being good, without Christ, are like filthy rags. We all, every one of us, shrivel up like a leaf and like the wind our sins sweep us away. Do you get that? This is why we needed a saviour, someone who could save us from our sins. Because as we see in Paul, uh, what Paul says in Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Friends, you might live a life that you describe as good. You might look at others who don't know Christ, who are, in your eyes, good people. Oh, they're great people who surely a just and loving God, surely a God who was like that wouldn't judge them. But since when did you become God, where you could dictate what is good and acceptable? Did you write the rule book? Or as God said to Job, let's have a look at this. Open your Bibles, make sure you've got them open, and look at Job 38, 1 to 7. In fact, you should later on read this whole passage. Job 38, 1 to 7. Let's read this. Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. He said, Who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set, and who laid its cornerstone? While the morning stars sang together, and all the angels shouted for joy. And God goes on for quite a while questioning Job regarding his wisdom and his abilities. And then he says further on in Job 48, and I want you to really listen to this. When he asks Job, would you discredit my justice? Would you condemn me? to justify yourself. Would you discredit my justice? 
would you condemn me to justify yourself? Friends, we have all sinned and we are all in need of a saviour. That's why Jesus came to bring light into the darkness to save men from their sins. Matthew 1, 22 to 23 says, All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. God has revealed through his prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 7, 14, the details of the birth of the coming Messiah. The chasm between God and man would be breached. Emmanuel, God became flesh and dwelt amongst us. Isaiah 7, 14, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Pastor David Legg, in describing what Emmanuel actually meant for the Jews of Jewish day, uh, Jesus' day, sorry, described it in this way. And I loved it, so I thought I'd use it here. I'll get you to close your eyes and picture this. Close your eyes where you are and picture this as I, as I describe this to you. An artist once drew a picture of a winter twilight. The trees within the picture were heavily laden with snow. There was a dreary dark house in the background that looked lonely and desolate. Right there in the midst of the storm, all that could be seen was a dark black house shadowed with the silhouette of the trees. Have you got that? Have you got that in your mind? It is a sad picture. But then, with a quick stroke, just one quick stroke, with a yellow crayon, the artist simply put in a streak of light coming from the window. The effect is transforming. It was magical because the entire scene was translated into a vision of comfort, a vision of cheer coming from that house. So when the people of Jesus' day thought of Emmanuel, this is the kind of picture that they would relate to. That one stroke where Emmanuel comes into the picture, he changes the entire scenery. As it goes from a dark and bleak picture, one with no hope or true joy, to a light in the darkness, bringing hope and joy, changing the entire landscape with that piercing light. And that is what Jesus has done. Jesus understood that he was the light of the world and that the world needed his light. He tells us this very thing in John 8, 12, where he says, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Do you follow Jesus? Are you walking in the light or in the darkness? It was a big call when Jesus made the statement, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Friends, that offer for each of us to have the light of life is on the table right now. It's on the table right now. Do you have the light of life? Have you asked Jesus into your life? God knew what was happening. He had a plan to bring salvation to the lost. He had a plan to peel back the darkness that had descended when sin entered the world. The answer to this terrible darkness was to send the one who could save the people from their sins. And the only person who could do that, the only person who could do that, because you and I couldn't, the only person who could do that, untainted by sin, was God's only begotten Son, Jesus, who was God with us, Emmanuel. If you don't know Jesus, then you must seek him out. You must seek him out. Knock and the door shall be open to you. If you do know Jesus, then let me encourage you to rejoice in what Jesus has done for you. And tell others. Tell others all about Jesus. Our Emmanuel. God with us. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I just ask that you would speak to each of us. Uh, through your word, Lord, that you would 
uh, for those that need encouragement, Lord, that you would encourage them greatly. And for those that, uh, Lord, need correction, that you would correct them and that they wouldn't, uh, um, they wouldn't shy away from that. Lord, if there's any that don't know you, I just ask, Lord, that uh, your Holy Spirit would knock on their heart and that you would uh, soften their heart and that they would let you in and that they would know about you and just how amazing you are. Lord, I just ask that you would touch each person where they're at. Lord, and that it would be a mighty thing. I ask this thing in Jesus' beautiful name. Amen.